When I was 15, my mum died after a protracted period of illness. And ironically, I think I was probably the one that expected her to die most because I'd been kept so in the dark about the illness that, um, well, not no, not in the dark. I, I, people had not wanted to tell me too much about it in order to protect me. So even though the medical consensus, I think, was that she probably wouldn't die, at least not in the near future, she did all of a sudden. And I expected it because the fact that I hadn't been told anything meant that I had assumed the worst. Um, and so I was probably, ironically, the most emotionally well prepared for it. And it's very strange to think about because when she died, I I'd sort of imagined it happening a few times before it did happen. And I'd imagined that there must be some kind of feeling that you can't even conceive of before it happens that suddenly comes into being after it happens, that just completely destroys you. And that wasn't my experience of it when it actually happened. I felt a strange cocktail of feelings. Um, but one thing I didn't really get was the, the traditional idea of stages of grief progressing from denial to whatever it is next, to whatever it is next. The one period of what I could confidently describe as really bad feeling that I did get was the next morning at about nine before I went for a walk. And that was sort of me leaning on my dad's shoulder and saying, I wish I was dead because, you know, she's never coming back and that, you know, this is something that's very bad that's happened and it's ir irretrievable. This relationship with my mum is irretrievable kind of thing. And that for about five or 10 minutes, that did feel really, really very bad. Um, but before that, and after that, I, uh, it's hard to describe how I felt, but, and it sounds awful to say, I don't think I felt that bad. I was crying, but the crying felt cathartic and good. Um, you know, there's never been a period where I haven't been able to talk about my mum's death. Um, I was able to talk about it 10 minutes after it happened. I was able to talk about it an hour after it happened and a day after it happened. And every single point in time between then and now, nine or so years later, I've been perfectly able to talk about it. <clears throat> There's been no feeling that I needed to push it out of my head or pretend it hasn't happened. Um, and although there was certainly negative feeling there, a lot of the feeling wasn't negative. Um, the funeral was a time to see family and I really, really enjoyed the funeral. There was pretty much no, a no aspect of the funeral that made me feel that bad, really. Um, yeah, as I say, it sounds almost horrible to say. Um, but yeah, I experienced a similar thing when my grandmother died um, shortly before Covid. Um, obviously, you, you kind of expect your grandparents to die a little bit more than you expect your parents to die, but I loved her very, very much, and I respected her probably more than anyone else in the world, um, and I still do. But her death, I'm, I'm more confident in saying, didn't upset me in the slightest. It didn't make me feel at all bad. It didn't make me feel existentially like I'd lost something that was vital to me. Um, I loved her very much, and of course I would have gone to tremendous lengths to prevent these people dying if I'd been able to at the time. But, you know, when my grandmother died I didn't feel bad at all. I cried in a cathartic way. I talked to her lots about it before she died. But it didn't, you know, to say it upset me would require a redefining of the word upset um, to the point that it would almost be meaningless. Um, yeah. And <laughs> that is a very personal way of starting a video, but these experiences and experiences like it of, of watching certain members of my family react in similar ways to death, pretty emotionally, not, not indifferently, but without an enormous amount of traumatic negative emotion has made me think about um, the assumptions we make about emotion cross-culturally. Um, can emotions, as we feel them and as we perceive them, can they be generalised to other cultures? Do people from 
vastly different cultures experience emotions completely differently? Or are there things that are fundamental to the human experience that all people from all cultures, barring neurological conditions, will experience in pretty much the same way? And I've, I've made comments in the past like, emotions must be very different from culture to culture. I think I actually made one in a recent video. And that was just an assumption of mine. I hadn't looked that far into it at that point, although I had been curious about it. I probably shouldn't have said something so um, presumptuous. But somebody um, commented that they, they were surprised that I'd said this and that to them it seemed like emotions are the most kind of visceral, deep human experience that you'd expect to be the same from culture to culture. Whereas to me, they're such vague, conceptual, difficult to describe things that they must be very different from culture to culture. Um, of course, neither person's intuition is necessarily right on that one. Uh, and so we have to turn to the literature to um, really dive that far into it. Before I go on, I just want to point out that I'm not trying to suggest I have some kind of weird emotional resilience because there are things in my life that have made me feel extraordinarily bad. They just haven't been deaths. Um, <clears throat> But, in any case, anthropologists nowadays tend to assume that things aren't cultural universals. So many times have anthropologists guessed or assumed that things might be true of all human cultures, and so often have they been proven wrong. How people experience time, how people think about cause and effect, things that we completely take for granted, differ massively from culture to culture. And I'd always assumed that emotions were the same. Um, but I realise that's not necessarily the case. Emotion works on many levels, so before even reading any psychological literature, it seems to me like there's the visceral, indescribable feeling, and then there's the physical feeling that might come from that, like heart racing and things like that, and then the thoughts you have as a result of that feeling, and then the words and actions that emerge from those thoughts. And then at the end of, other end of the equation, there are the causes of the emotion, the environmental things that happen that make you feel that way. It seems like there are a few approaches to emotion within neuroscience, and some of those lean towards the idea of there being cross-culturally universal emotions, and some lean away from that idea. Almost like in linguistics, where there are arguments about whether there are universal aspects of grammar, there's a debate around whether there are universal aspects of emotion that are biological and independent of a person's culture. The supposedly universal emotions in the literature are called basic emotions. And in 2011, Robert Levinson said that in order to count as a neurologically basic emotion, an emotion has to be obviously distinctive and different from other basic emotions, hardwired into actual physical circuitry within the brain, and it needs to have some adaptive advantage that helps the person survive or reproduce. I don't know if I completely agree with the last one, but he lists six basic emotions which are widely accepted. Enjoyment, anger, disgust, fear, surprise and sadness. Um, and I've also heard contempt described as a basic emotion as well. I assume here that it's a given that it's possible to experience more than one basic emotion at a time and that these things can combine, although I don't know that for certain. To establish that these basic emotions exist and are biologically hardwired, you'd have to conduct studies of people from several cultures and try to find a common phenomenon in all of them that you could reasonably call enjoyment, for example. But that's quite a tall order. So let's say there's a specific bit of neural circuitry that everyone has that seems to start firing at the same time as they outwardly appear sad. So for example, they make a sad face or they cry. And let's say that this circuitry isn't the part of the brain that's making them cry on a mechanical level. Let's say this circuitry seems to be where the internal emotion is happening. Does that mean that we've found sadness as a physiological thing within the brain? Well, I think that's hard to say. What event in the environment has caused the brain to behave in this way? What's caused the circuitry to light up? Let's say this reaction is caused by a friend dying. The friend has died, the person's found out about it, the circuitry in their brain has lit up, and they've started reacting physiologically to it by crying and making a sad face. When you ask them, they reply that they're sad and that they really wish the person hadn't died. This scenario might seem fairly familiar, and most of us watching probably wouldn't have any trouble saying that this was sadness or grief. Now let's change a few things and see when it stops being sadness or grief. Let's say that instead of someone dying, the stimulus was some grass growing where it wouldn't normally grow. 
the circuitry is activated, the person is crying and they tell you that they're sad about the grass growing and they wish it wasn't growing there, maybe in their culture grass growing that way is a sign that it'll be a bad summer or something like that. Even though we personally wouldn't get upset by the grass growing, we still probably understand this as sadness. Now let's change one thing again. Instead of claiming to be sad, the person just says, grass shouldn't grow in that place, I'm very confused. You ask them if they're sad and they say no, they're not sad, they're just confused about why the grass is there. They don't really care whether it grows there in future, they're just confused why it's there all of a sudden. Is this still sadness just because it has the physiological characteristics of sadness? Well, if the idea of basic emotions is that they're biologically hardwired, then surely this is sadness because it's physiologically indistinguishable from British sadness or American sadness. But many of us would be reluctant to call it sadness because the person doesn't seem to be experiencing anything negative or anything that they'd rather avoid. This example is just a hypothetical, but it's how I've thought about my reaction to some family deaths. I physiologically react in a sad way, but I don't necessarily feel that bad about it. I feel strongly about it, but I don't really spend any time wishing that it hadn't happened or wishing that things were different. In fact, in a lot of cases, I really don't think I'd describe it as a negative experience at all. Is it sadness? The reason I think this matters is because it affects what we think is necessary in cultures. If we think of people's reactions to death as difficult and requiring resolution like they often are in our culture, we might bark up the wrong tree. If we think of funerary rituals as a way of resolving the emotional dissonance caused by death, we're assuming that there is emotional dissonance. Um, we're assuming something needs resolving when it doesn't necessarily. The idea of basic emotions isn't universally accepted, so some researchers take a constructivist approach that instead of there being a small number of basic hardwired emotions that light up in certain situations, emotion exists on a continuum and our brains construct a new emotion for every situation that requires one. When we talk or think about these emotions, we group them into discrete categories like happy or sad. But in reality, each new experience produces an emotion from scratch, with the brain combining different circuits to create a reaction that seems appropriate based on its past experience. The fact that it's basing this emotional response on past experience means that an individual ends up with a load of emotional reactions that they're pretty familiar with. Even though emotional reactions are constructed on the fly, according to this theory, your reaction to one thing might end up being pretty similar to a previous emotional reaction you've had to another thing, um, because the brain has learned that that's an appropriate response to a certain situation. And in this way, we all end up with a load of emotional responses that we recognise and are fairly familiar with, although sometimes the brain might produce something fresh in response to a situation it's never encountered before, and we might not be quite sure what we're feeling. This theory lends itself more to the idea that culture influences emotion. So when you're raised in a particular culture, other people's emotional responses to things will influence how your brain constructs your emotions. And so two different cultures that don't have much contact with each other might end up with completely different emotional spaces that are loosely shaped by survival related pressures, but which are really very different for the people experiencing them. It might not surprise you that this idea appeals a bit more to me because it allows for more variation from culture to culture in terms of people's experiences. But me being drawn to it doesn't mean that it's true. There's definitely evidence in favour of the idea of basic, hardwired, categorically distinct emotions. Although as far as I'm aware nobody's pinned down any specific neural circuitry that corresponds to each emotion, there are several distinct facial expressions that have specific characteristics and appear across all cultures studied. Regardless of culture, people across the world all make an expression like this, which we'd call smiling. They don't necessarily all make this expression in response to the same kinds of thing, but it is a facial expression that seems to be cross-culturally very common and seems to arise from an internal emotional state. And a certain amount of work has been done to show that across a lot of cultures, people make these faces in responses to similar stimuli. If you show two different people from different cultures the same film, they'll make similar expressions at similar points in the film. I imagine, although I haven't asked them, I imagine that a lot or most researchers um, that are studying this on an academic level would say that the truth lies somewhere between those two approaches, from the constructivist approach to the basic emotions approach. But in any case, hopefully this video has been a little um, thought exercise about the difficulty of thinking about emotion from culture to culture and how there are various levels on which emotional reactions may be different from one culture to the next. It's not just a case of the fundamental feeling, but also what causes that feeling and um, 
the results of that feeling at various different levels. Thank you very much indeed for watching. Um, people have told me to stop apologising for my appearance, so I won't apologise for the fact that I'm coated in sweat. Um, I suppose in, in some way I have apologised for it by indicating that I'm not apologising for it, but there you go.